morning. This morning's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 26, verses 69 to 75. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came up to him and said, You also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. Well, I hope your uh, finger is open to Matthew chapter 26. We're going to talk about kind of a sad story. You know, when a, a well-known Christian leader in the community fails, it's big news. I mean, you look at a Christian leader falling to some sin, and it's not only local news, but often it makes CNN and Fox news. A local pastor falls to some grievous sin. And it's on all the newspapers and everybody's talking about it. Well, in our story today, it's not just a well-known leader. It is the right-hand leader of Jesus. Uh, this is the man, Peter, who uh, witnessed the transfiguration. This is the man who, uh, who, who, when overwhelmed by Jesus supplying fish for his nets, said, Depart from me, Lord. I'm a man. I'm a sinful man. This is the man who saw who Jesus was and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is the man who stepped out of the boat and walked on water with Jesus. And this is the man who in a very dark night denied even knowing Jesus. Not once, not twice, but three times. Now let's be honest here. We don't stand in judgment on Peter because we know what it's like to fail. We understand temptation. We understand sin. We've done things that we regret, things that have caused us to feel ashamed of ourselves. We've done things that, well, let's be honest, we, we, we'll be in a conversation with someone and the subject of Jesus Christ or religion comes up and rather than entering in and talking about how we, much we love Christ and how much He's done for us, we're silent. And we know what that's like. And so we don't stand in judgment on Peter. We, we identify with him. But I want to encourage you today that even the failure of Peter brings amazing hope. What we're going to do is we're going to look at the three denials, and then from that, we're going to look at four lessons of hope, and there, then we'll conclude with one big idea, okay? So you kind of know where we're going, and we're looking at Matthew 26, and we'll look at the three denials, four lessons of hope, and then one big idea to take us on our way. Matthew 26, verse 69, we see the first denial of Peter. It says, Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. I just want to pause there. Where is Jesus? Well, we learned last week, if you were here, Jesus has just gone before Caiaphas, the high priest, and is being tried by Jewish leaders. And whereas Jesus was very open and bold about saying who he was, and that he would be coming back and reigning forever. Peter is a very different story. So there's quite a contrast between Jesus' boldness and Peter's cowardice. Not only that, at the end of the story last week, we saw that Jesus was slapped, beaten, and spit upon. So Jesus is inside the high priest's home, undergoing this rigorous trial, 
And in the meantime, Peter is in the courtyard outside. Now, this is a statement that displays his courage. Rather than run like the other disciples, Peter, who claimed he would stick with Jesus to the end, courageously enters that courtyard and stands by watching. But a servant girl comes up to him and says, you were also with Jesus, the Galilean. We don't know if she was kind of the gatekeeper, and as people came in, she noticed what they were wearing, noticed who they were, but she linked him with Jesus. And um, it's funny how people can tell immediately where we're from just by looking at us. And when I read that, I thought, how did she know that Peter was a Galilean? Uh, I remember the first time I went to Germany, and I was with uh, some other Americans, we were walking down the street in Chemnitz, Germany, which is on the eastern side of the country, and we dressed as much as possible like Germans. And so we're walking down the street, and here comes three teenage boys. And uh, as they approached us and, and got alongside of us, one of the boys turned to us and said, Welcome, Americans. <laughs> and I thought, how did he know that? How did he know that? Here I was trying to be cool, you know, just like fitting in with one of the... And he knew immediately. Well, that's what happened here. For some reason, this girl linked Peter with uh, Jesus being from the same region of Galilee. And notice what Peter's response was to her. He denied it. He denied before them all, saying, I don't know what you mean. Now, let's cut him a little slack. Uh, It caught him off guard. He came in there wanting to stand by Jesus. Here he is on the spot. And um, he was caught off guard. Now, should he have been caught off guard? Well, just previous to this, Jesus had warned Peter that temptations would come. In fact, Jesus quoted Zechariah 13, verse 7, which said, They will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. And he also told Peter in the Garden of Gethsemane, Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. So Peter was forewarned, but Peter was caught. Peter was caught. I'm just going to say it. Peter was caught in his own self-confidence. Here's the man who would stand strong and take out a sword and slice off an ear going for the man's head. But when it came to a servant girl, in that vulnerable place, he denied Jesus. That often happens when we're caught off guard. Beware of allowing pride and complacency and overconfidence put you in a vulnerable position. I really like what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. This is a verse worthy to be memorized Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. Any of us. I mean, if if Peter can fall to temptation, how much more can I fall to temptation? Can you? Peter says, I don't know what you mean. He pleads ignorance. He's an agnostic. I don't know what you're talking about. And then Peter kind of shuffles off to the shadows. We see his second denial, verse 71. He goes out to the entrance, walks away from the fire, walks a little further away from Jesus, and another servant girl sees him. We're not sure what's going on here. Maybe the first girl's shift ended, and she clocked out, and the other girl came in, and and maybe the first girl said to her, Hey, that you better watch that guy over there. I think he was one of the rabble-rousers with Jesus. We're not sure. But she recognizes that Peter is from Galilee. And so she says, and please note this, she says to the bystanders, again putting him on the spot, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Now, one of the other gospel reader, writers says that she might have known Malchus, the one whose Peter, uh, ear Peter sliced off. Somehow she knew Peter had been uh, an associate of Jesus. And note the response of Peter in verse 72. 
He denied it with an oath. I don't know the man. Now, he used an oath, and somebody will say, well, does that mean he was cussing? Well, it's, it's the word that's often used for, for swearing, but in this sense, it wasn't that he was uh, cussing. He was using an oath to try to prove his innocence. It, it would be like somebody saying, I'm telling the truth. I'll swear on a Bible. Or, or oh, I, I, God is my witness. Mm-hmm. This is why Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 33 to 37, look it up sometime. This is why Jesus warned us not to use oaths swearing on something sacred because the reality is we're probably lying if we have to go to that extent. <laughs> and Peter was lying. In fact, you see that Peter could not even use Jesus' name. I don't know the man. Peter it's really shocking because this is the same man who in verse 33, remember that? If you look up a little further in the text, Matthew 26, 33, Peter had answered Jesus when Jesus said, you'll deny me. Peter said, though all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Peter had a big self-confident faith in himself. I always worry when somebody says, oh, I will never do that. So-and-so might, but I never would. I think, oh, watch out. And then we come to the third denial, verses 73 to 75. After a little while, one of the other gospel writers says about an hour later, the bystanders came up to Peter, and they, one of them said, uh, Hey, certainly you too were one of them, for your accent betrays you. Now things are getting a little dicey. His accent betrayed him. His accent showed the fact that he was from Galilee, which is where Jesus was from. Now, let's be honest here. I mean, let's think about this for a moment. Jerusalem swelled with pilgrims coming to celebrate the Passover. There were many people from Galilee there with an accent who had no association with Jesus whatsoever. And so Peter did not have to fear that. But because he was placed in the focus, the spotlight was on, he became very nervous. His accent betrayed him. Have you ever been in a place where they spoke a different form of American language? Uh, I once moved to Dallas, Texas, and I got a job at Baylor University Medical Center. And I'll never forget my first day on the job. And I was saying a few things, and this lady came up to me, and she says, you're one of those blank Yankees. And I looked at her, and all of a sudden, I realized that they're still fighting the Civil War in Dallas. I was shocked. You're one of those blank Yankees. And uh, I got to know her a little bit. Things went better, but I, I mean, talk about feeling on the spot. Everybody around me talking Texan, and I'm speaking Iowan, which is good English. <laughs> Sorry if you're from Texas. But you talk about feeling on the spot, and especially being identified as a blank Yankee. <laughs> That's how Peter felt. All of a sudden, there he is. Certainly you too are one of them. Oh, dear. He's one of them, Jesus follower. Anybody ever said that to you? You say, well, you know, I go to Stonebridge Church. Oh, you're one of them. Now, what do you mean? Oh, you teach the Bible over there. You're a bunch of Bible beaters over there. What do you do? You're one of them. Happens today, too. So how does Peter respond? Then he began to invoke a curse on himself. He cursed himself. You know what that literally means? He's crying out, may God curse me if I'm telling a lie here. I mean, it's amazing that God didn't. Strike him dead at the spot. He invokes that curse on himself, and then he says again, 
I swear I do not know the man. And then, I apologize to roosters. Poor rendition, but I just can't imagine that. I don't know the man. Uh, and then it said, Peter remembered something. What did he remember? He remembered that Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. How did he remember that? Because Jesus had put it in his mind. Jesus had forewarned him, you're going to deny me. And then the rooster will crow. And so when the rooster crowed, can you imagine that moment? Our Bibles tell us he went out and he wept bitterly. He remembered and he wept. Have you ever been so overcome with your failure that you just wanted to cry about it? The most manly men weep over their failure. The most womanly of women weep over failure. A sense of shame can grip us. You know, the other gospel writers paint a beautiful picture, and if I had time, I'd talk about some of the criticisms that are given at, at this point about the gospel writers having different stories, and therefore you can't believe any of them. Such is far from the case. Actually, as you study the harmony of the Gospels, you see the richness and the layered com complexity and meaning in it. The Gospel writer named Luke writes this. He said, at that very moment when that rooster crowed, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered. Can you imagine that? The rooster crows. Peter looks up. And Jesus turns to look at Peter, face black and blue from the beating, spit on his shirt, and he looks at Peter. What do you think Jesus was thinking at that very moment? I think that in part there was a sense of sorrow in the heart of Jesus. Because when we fail Jesus... I think it grieves him. It grieved him to see Peter fail so miserably. In that moment when we cave in and give in to a temptation, it grieves the heart of Jesus. He looks at us. But there's more to that look than sadness. As Jesus looks at Peter, I would also contend that Jesus' look is filled with love and faith. Now you say, how can that be? Here's the guy who claimed he would never deny Jesus, a miserable failure. And Jesus looks at him at his worst moment. Where's the hope in that? I mean, this is a sad story. Well, that brings us to the four lessons of hope because there's some really powerful truth here. Four lessons. Do you know that the Bible says in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, whatever was written in former days, that is, written in the Scriptures for us, was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. I mean, this story is in the Bible because it's intended to give us hope. All four gospel writers include this story. Now, if one gospel writer includes it, that must mean it's important. But all four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, include it. This has very powerful truth to teach us. And I want you to think about this. If you are going to paint a picture of the human founder of the Christian faith, would you have painted this founder in such a miserable light? 
This is one of the reasons that we believe the Bible. It is brutally honest with human failure. Abraham told a king that his wife was his sister. Moses got mad and struck a rock and wasn't allowed to enter the promised land. David sinned with his eyes and his actions, had adultery with Bathsheba, and put a contract out on her husband's life. And Peter denied Jesus. One reason we believe the Bible is that it is brutally honest with human failure. And because of that, we have some powerful things to learn from its truth. Lesson number one, and I'm going to talk about two things we can learn about ourselves and two things we can learn about God in this passage. And by the way, so often when you read the Bible, you're thinking, how does this apply to me? I'll tell you a more important question. What does this teach me about God? That's where the real core of encouragement comes. Let's talk about two things this teaches about us. <clears throat> Number one, we learn here that we should not be overconfident about our own abilities. We should not think that we can withstand temptation. So many people think that they're strong enough to do that. We live in a culture that tells us that we can do anything we want to do. And we grow up believing. You know, I can just, especially people who are supremely gifted, often are overconfident. There was no more gifted disciple than Peter. A man among men, a leader among leaders. And it is so easy to begin to trust in ourselves. Here is a good verse to memorize. Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. Who can understand it? On our best day, we still deceive ourselves. We deceive ourselves all the time. We are thinking we're better than we are or we think we're worse than we are. So often, we deceive ourselves and we don't even know we're deceiving ourselves. Sometimes people have to speak truth into us and we don't like it because we don't want to accept the truth. But my friends, we would do well to learn this lesson. Do not trust your own self. You say, that sounds kind of negative. I know it. But we're going to go on to talk about who we do trust. We need an honest self-appraisal. We will fail. And this is why Jesus told us, to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. This is why he told Peter, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Don't trust yourself. Pray. I know that's a hard pill to swallow, but that's why we need to talk about the second truth, which is that when we do fail... We will be filled with shame. In Peter's weeping, we see a man who is ashamed, intensified by the fact that Jesus turned and looked at him at the moment of his failure. But what we learn about shame is not to stay stuck in our shame, but to repent and turn to Christ in the midst of it. Allow failure and shame to draw us into what the Bible calls a godly repentance. Repentance just means I own up to what I did, and I turn away from it, and I turn to Christ for help. The Apostle Paul spoke of this wonderful truth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. He said, For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation, without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. And the New Living Translation says it this way, for the kind of sorrow God wants us to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. I wonder how many people get stuck in shame after a failure. And that shame becomes a constant companion to the point that they look through glasses 
and their perspective is one of shame, and they never feel like they're good enough and can measure up enough. I hear it when people say, oh, I would never be good enough. You don't know what I'm like. I would never go feel good enough to go to church and sit next to those good church people. And I say to them when I hear this, what, are you crazy? If you knew what that person was like sitting next to you, you would move. We all have failure and regret and shame. There ought to be a sign posted at the back. No perfect people allowed. We're all guilty of sin and shame and failure. The point, though, is that there is a worldly shame that leaves you stuck and a godly shame that leads you to say, I hate it! I'm going to turn to Christ who died for that very sin. You see the difference? Here we find it. By the way, if you're a life group leader, you need to go to the life group resources that Pastor Jason put out because he's got a great paper of points talking about the blessings of repentance. When shame and failure come into our lives, that very thing can lead us to repentance and trust in Christ to find forgiveness and healing of our souls. By the way, Peter's sadness, sorrow, and shame led him to repentance. I'll tell you why in a moment. Judas, on the other hand, that we'll look at next weekend, had a worldly sorrow that led to his suicide. That's how clear the Scripture is. If you're locked in shame because of some failure or regret, my encouragement to you is you can be set free of that. And you can be set free today. Why would I say that? Because of our next two lessons. The third lesson, and the first about God, is this. When you fall, remember that Jesus is praying for you. If you know Jesus is your Savior and you're following Him, the very moment of your temptation, when God seems so far away, Jesus is there praying for you. Though you may not feel Him there, Though you may not know he's there, he is there praying for you. You say, how do you know that? Again, Dr. Luke. Luke 22, 31. Simon, Simon, Jesus told Peter, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But, <laughs> I love this. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Oh, what a wonderful promise. I'm sure Peter remembered this after Jesus rose from the dead, that even in his temptation and failure, Jesus was praying for him. Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore, He, Jesus, is able once and forever to save those who come to God through Him. He lives to intercede. He lives to pray with God on their behalf. And you know what happens? And I don't know how the Trinity works. It's a mystery, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But this I know. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us, Romans 8.34. We fail. We flounder. We fall on our faces. We feel shame. And the devil comes along. See, God, I told you they would fail. They, you, you think you're a good Christian? Look at them. Look at them. And Jesus is there, and he says, Oh, this is my child. This is my child. I'm praying for them. I'm praying their faith will not fail. I'm praying that when they come out of this, they'll restore, the, they'll strengthen the faith of their brothers. Maybe through the shame and pain of this very failure can spring out life. I get excited about that. I get excited when I, as you probably know this, uh, I get excited when I sit in a Bible study and a guy says, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic, but I've been sober for 20 years, and I'm just grateful to God. That is Jesus praying for a guy. He's praying for you. At the moment you feel most ashamed, Jesus is looking at you, praying for you. 
doesn't that make your heart sing? And that leads us to the final point, isn't it? And that's not only that Jesus is praying for you, but failure is not final. Do I need to say it again? Failure is not forever. In fact, failure can become the beginning of something new and beautiful. Because you see, Jesus' prayer for Peter, that after he failed, he would be restored and then strengthen the faith of his brothers and sisters, was answered. Peter was restored through that godly repentance, sorrow that led him to trust in Jesus. I mean, have you ever had somebody serve you breakfast? I mean, imagine you're in a boat and you're fishing and you've been fishing for quite a number of hours and now the morning sun is coming up. Some of us can literally dream of this because the ice is finally melting. We can't get out, wait to get out on the lake and throw in our fishing lines. And you're in a boat, you know, and it's, the sun is beginning to come up and, and all of a sudden you smell something. You smell this beautiful odor coming from the shoreline and you notice and off in the distance somebody's cooking breakfast and you can smell it and, and, and your stomach begins to rumble. You can smell it. And then the person next to you in the boat says, Oh, I, I think that's Jesus. He's been raised from the dead. And, and Peter heard that and he says, Jesus. And, and you can tell how flustered he was because rather than take off his clothes and jump in and swim to Jesus, he put all his clothes back on. And then he jumped in the water and he swam as fast as he could to Jesus. John 21. And Jesus is serving breakfast to these guys. And then he pulls Peter off to the side. And this is what he says, John 21, verse 15. When they finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? <laughs> and Peter said to him, oh, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. How many times did Jesus say, Peter, do you love me? Three times. How many times did he say, feed my sheep, feed my lambs? Three times. One for every denial. Three times. And Jesus restored Peter to ministry. And if you read the writings, the letters of Peter in First and Second Peter, you see these themes of pride and humility and trusting Jesus through hard times coming in over and over again because of what happened in his denial. Do you know that all four Gospels write of the story, but the longest is the Gospel of Mark? Do you know who Mark's primary source was to write his Gospel? His cousin, Peter. And Peter, we know he knew he was forgiven because he would tell Mark all about his failure. All my friends, Every time from then on, according to the early church fathers, the rooster crowed. Ur, ur, ur. It's getting worse by the minute. I'm sure Peter heard that and wept. But he didn't weep with shame. He wept with relief because he knew that his failure and shame had led him to repent and trust in the one who never fails. Have you trusted in Jesus? You may be here exploring Christianity, and Jesus has seemed out there somewhere you don't understand it. That's okay. You're in a safe place. We're all on a journey. I would plead with you, though, to trust in Jesus as your Savior. All your shame and regrets were nailed to the cross 2,000 years ago. And Jesus in love looks at you today with love and with faith. Receive him, love him, trust him. Begin a relationship that will take you into eternity. Let's stand, shall we? Do you receive that, congregation? Isn't that a great encouraging message? Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful to you.
Now every time we hear a rooster crow, we'll remember Peter. And Lord, thank you that though failure and shame lead us to weep, we don't have to be stuck there. Our failure and shame can lead us to repentance that will lead us to the one who never fails. And Lord, we just want to sing, oh, how he loves you and me. We want to sing, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And we want to sing, crown him with many crowns. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. And that's the one big lesson, isn't it? That we will inevitably fail and shame can grip us. But if we allow that shame and failure to drive us to repentance, we will trust in the one who never fails. He never fails. I'm going to stick around up here, and if you would like to come and talk, I want to stay around. We have other leaders that would love to talk with you. Uh, you may want to have a relationship with Jesus. This would be a great time to come and talk about that. Let us help you uh, walk in that journey that we're all on. Uh, by the way, we have a, a three-minute thing we'd love to have you do. Uh, let's uh, be a the family of Jesus here, and let's extend love and concern to each other by looking for people we don't know, which shouldn't be too hard. Find somebody you don't know and just introduce yourself to them and take three minutes to get to know them, and then you can run back to the, your comfort zone <laughs> and talk to the people you know. This is a great way just to be Christ's family and to welcome each other in the name of Jesus. Thank you for coming. May the love of the Lord Jesus Christ the uh, glory of God the Father and the friendship of the Holy Spirit rest on you as you go out this week to follow Jesus. You're dismissed.